first of all, thanks. I'm, I apologize for not wearing red. <laughs> I'm not an Arkansas alumni. I went to uh, Missouri. So I'm a, I'm a Kansas City boy originally, and I live in New York now. I've been in New York since uh, 2000. Uh, been all over the place. As was mentioned, I used to work at CNN. I'm one of the people who launched CNN.com. So I was in this space before it was a space. I probably had a computer before most people had a computer in the 90s. Um, having said that, I've seen a lot of change. I've seen a lot of languishing. I've seen a lot of uh, gnashing of teeth with people trying to understand what's going on in this industry and, and how to best uh, use it. And so I think a lot of people, depending on, well, let me ask a question. How many people here are very active on social media? Very active, personally or professionally? Both. Uh, both. Excellent, that's great. Well, you guys know this already. <laughs> so what happens is a lot of people feel like they need to accomplish a mission, but they don't really know. There's too many platforms. And you wake up in the morning and you see another platform. Or somebody else tells you that you got to be using this, you got to be using that. The real thing to think about here, and it's what I tell everybody, is you don't have to use every platform. You have to use the platform that's appropriate for your audience. So the real ask is to go out and find your audience. And once you find out your audience is in a certain place, then you know what tool to use. It's sort of like having a screwdriver and a hammer. If you've got a, a, if you've got a screw sticking out of the wall, you don't use the hammer. So it's, it's that evident. And so I think what I'm going to do is try to walk you through kind of the rationale of what brands are thinking about and what agencies like Mitchell have to think about in, in able to keep up, and then how to maybe apply it to this audience identification that, that you all use from the, the Alumni Association, but then also you can use for your, your own brand or for brands that your friends work at or your neighbors. So it applies kind of across the board, but it really, uh, uh, it really goes into the fact of identifying the right tool for the right job. So with that, let's get started. And feel free, by the way, where do I? Is this over here? It is. Uh, slide the little button. Slide the little button. Sliding button. Pushing. Technology. Yeah. So it's the other one. All right. Sorry about that. So this is a big, complicated slide. <laughs> In a nutshell, what it says, and feel free to read it, um, what it really says is what public relations used to be, and you can substitute public relations with marketing communications, with brand marketing. What it used to be is a broadcast. The goal of an agency used to be just to put out a press release and make sure that the media can get a hold of it and do what they, whatever they do, they're going to go make the content, right? And then everybody in the media got laid off. And so the reporter doesn't have a crew to go out anymore. They don't have a photographer, they don't have a video artist. So what is, what's happening now is the reporter, the media outlet, now some bloggers, which blogging started off as a lot of people that were unemployed and said, well, I'm gonna go make a living because I know a lot about cookies, so I'm gonna write a blog about making cookies. So what's happened is the reporters now, my wife's a reporter, she sits home and she's on her iPad looking for topics of things to cover. So she's doing, she's pitching herself. And so what's happened now is what used to be a, a broadcast and a monologue from a company is now social channels and a dialogue. And what the important part of it used to be, you know, media outreach used to be the primary goal. And the primary agency driver was the creative concept. It was, you know, what's the big, what's the big firework you can put out there? What's the big sparkler that's going to draw the most attention? Now it's being discoverable. So when the reporter is looking for their story, they have to be discoverable. Well, they can't be discoverable if you're not putting out any content. And then the, the agency driver now are the insights. And the insights are, it goes back to what I was first talking about. If you, if you know how to find your audience, the insights that your audience give you give you the, the information you need to know what kind of content to produce. So if you, if you see that there's 10 bloggers that really talk about a certain topic, and you see that they really use video a lot, you better start making some videos for them or else you're not making useful content for them. So, what does this mean? It means that brands and agencies have to take advantage of this change, and they have to go around this wheel. And it's, it's not that complicated. It really starts off with analytics. That's the, that's the search. You want to find out who you're looking for. And then it goes into creative. The analytics are going to tell you who and what and where. The creative is going to tell you what's going to make the most impact. And then you have to go your earned and paid media. 
Paid media, you've got to activate it. Just like you've got an invitation to come in here. That's a form of paid media. You've got an invitation, you've got a notification to come here and see this talk. So once you're in here, then you get the content, and now the community management part is the hashtag. Simplified. The community management part, if you use the hashtag volunteers rock for this example, then what, what the other people with the Alumni Association know now is they can go curate this conversation and see what kind of impact this whole effort had today by who tweeted, what did they say, what kind of content was shared. So it gives them a real sense of being able to measure it. So that's really all that means, is you take all of this now and you make things that are now measurable. Because if you do something in the, in the old school way, you did something, you put out a press release, you didn't really know what happened to it. You might have known that it went on the Today Show or it got on to the local radio or the local newspaper. But after that, you don't know who else consumed it. You don't know where that newspaper, did that newspaper go and get handed to somebody else. Now you can tell where it gets passed off to, where it gets shared to. And shareability is probably the next uh, most important term that you'll hear other than discoverability. So discoverability, then shareability. So you don't want to, you don't want to create things that are just uh, a, a rock in the pond. You want, you want it to be able to float like a boat and go other places. So the social mission, does this all fit on there? Good. The social mission, we, what we want to do is we want to engage our audiences, that's the A, with research first, you got to figure out who you're talking to, and then communication with content that has context. So a lot of people talk about putting out content, you need a content strategy in public relations and in social digital media. But the content strategy is only valid if the content you're putting out resonates with the audience. If I put out content right now and started talking about uh, Missouri football, I'm talking to the wrong audience. So if I know that I'm in a room full of Razorback alum, then I better be talking about Razorback alum. So I have to target my content. I mean, it's as simple as that. You have to know your audience, and once you know your audience, then you develop the content that resonates with them, because then they're more likely to A, listen to you, and B, share it with people that are also in their community. All right, so what do we do? We offer to identify and engage beyond the media. We have to be creative, relevant, and authentic. We have to be real. We can't pay bloggers. In the agency world, sorry about that, I just touched my mic. In the agency world, the, the brands that we work with always want us to engage with bloggers. And then they, they want us to, but we have to be authentic, right? So we can't pay bloggers. I can't compensate a blogger to write a post about my new product, because if the media gets a hold of that, they're going to skewer me. Because I just bought, it's back when I first started in the business, called Yellow Journalism. If you pay for it, it's not authentic brand journalism. You'll hear brand journalism as a term. So brands as journalists, if brands are putting out content, I have to be able to give you the product, and then if you write your blog, some of you are going to hate it, some of you are going to love it, some of you aren't going to say anything at all. I have to take the good with the bad with the nothing, as a brand. So from an agency standpoint, I have to, I have to talk about that every day and say, you know what, of the 100 people that, that we went to, six people might do something with it. But those six people might reach a collective 100,000 people. But of those six people, four of them might say something good, and two of them may say something bad. But to be out there, you have to take that risk. So if you look at it like dating, we're all familiar with dating. If you're out there putting yourself out there, you're presentable, you're interesting, you're charismatic, some people are going to like you and gravitate towards you, and some people are not. So it's as simple as that. When you're out dating, back in the day when I was dating before I got married, I had to pay attention. And brands have to pay attention because they're dating now. Now it's a two-way thing. It's no longer just a broadcast. It's a two-way thing. People are now responding to me. And if I'm not responding back, then I'm not a good date. So core PR offerings now have changed. When an agency has to think about this for a brand, what we have to think about is what's, you know, brands used to come to agencies and say, we need a press release, we need a satellite media tour, uh, we like to have a celebrity show up and shake hands at the local mall, whatever it is. That, that's old PR. That old PR I'm talking about five years ago. It's not even that old. Now we have to talk about it. strategy, creative, technology, content production, uh, analytics and insights, probably the biggest and most important change. Design, mobile programs, mobile, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, mobile is probably the biggest change. Uh, who here does not have a quote unquote smartphone? So, target audience right here. You are the people that everyone's trying to get to. 
And the same thing for you, when you're trying to get to people, if you're not thinking about it mobily, then you're missing out on an audience because people aren't necessarily sitting in front of their laptop anymore, or in their living room anymore, or picking up their phone anymore. They're not, you know, I get people to call me all the time. When I, my alumni association calls me, and they never get to me because I hardly ever answer my phone because I have a cell phone. I hardly ever answer my cell phone because people text me. And so I always think if you really know me and you really know how to get to me, you'll text me because you know how to get to me, or you'll send me a tweet, or you'll, you, you're on my Facebook page, something. That's how people get to me now. My wife, who's a reporter, only accepts pitches on her uh, show fan, uh, Facebook fan page. She used to take them via email. She used to have her phone number out there. She used to take them via Twitter. She doesn't even do that anymore. She's, she'll, she sends out emails to people, to publicists, and says, if you want to get to me, pitch me on my Facebook page. That does two things. It forces people to come to Facebook to put out content, so her readers also get this content now, people that are on her page. But it also requires people to like her page, so she generates audience traffic to her Facebook page by saying, you need to go here to interact with her. Engagement is probably the other big, big, big word here. Engagement means you have to actually talk. I have to develop a conversation with you. And if I'm not developing a conversation, if I'm just putting out a message and then I'm moving on, if you have a question, I'm gone. So I need to stick around a little bit and I need to listen. So that's where analytics come in because you might put out a question out there on Twitter. Hey, I wonder what's going on here and there. Hashtag something. If I'm not monitoring that, I have no idea you asked a question. And then you're disgruntled. And then you feel abandoned and you go away. And from a brand standpoint, then you're not a customer. So the web, don't bother reading all this. It's a lot of small print. But the web is an ecosystem. And I like to put this in really, really, really down in the dirt terms, literally. How many of you garden? Anyone? All right, not many gardeners in here, but <laughs> I'm gonna use the analogy anyway, it works, trust me. If you look at a plot of land, you've gotta pick a place that's sunny, well-drained, has good dirt, that's your, that's the place where you're going to plant your seeds. So if you look at the top, that's your publishing platforms. So as, a, as an ecosystem here, I'm going to compare that to your publishing platforms. So you think, well, something's appropriate for YouTube, or something's appropriate for Flickr, or Instagram, or Pinterest. But you have to identify that fertile ground. And that's through the analytics, why is it fertile? And then your search tools, through SEO and SEM, those are sort of identifying the DNA of what's going to go in that ground. Well, tomatoes, that's, a good, that's good for tomatoes. So if it's Pinterest, it's going to be my recipes. So you, you, it's synonymous with what the ground can grow. What is the ground fertile for? What can it grow? What's appropriate to my audience? My audience likes tomatoes. I'm going to plant tomatoes. So then your web properties become the nutrients. That's the fertilizer. So all of this stuff you put out is the fertilizer because people have to know that the tomatoes are growing. So it's the notification that they're growing so that they can actually find them. And then the conversation places, that's the sunlight and the rain. That's what opens up the sunlight and the rain for people to come in and talk to you about the tomatoes that you're growing. So it's the conversation place. It's the market. It's the farmer's market. So you're growing them over here because you identified it. You're advertising it over here because you want people to know you're growing. And then you have your storefront on Saturday morning here so you can sell your tomatoes. And that's really, if you put it in these sort of simple terms, that's why a lot of people in my role, you know, living in New York City, there's a lot of people that get very fancy about this stuff. It's, it doesn't have to be that hard. It's, it's literally as organic as what you do every day when you talk to people. You're doing social media, you've done social media all day long, you've done it all your lives. So it's just putting it in context. So the social approach is literally research first. You've got to figure out where your audience is. So from an alumni standpoint, you've got to figure out where are the alumnus? How do you get to them? What do they do? How do you get them to interact? How do you be interested? How do you, how do you go from not being a, a once a month post on Facebook to tell your audience what's going on with the association to an engaged audience? that is talking maybe every day and sharing a photograph of their kids and maybe what they had for dinner and all that in a really organic, engaged community. So you've got to research, what do these people do? So if you know your audience, if you know the, the 100 people that live in your area, I really, you're all from all over the country, right? Mm -hmm. So 
if you know the 100 people, I'm making that up, in your area, and you kind of can get, well, you know, 65 of them are kind of into, hmm, I mean, 20 are kind of into that, and, well, then you know what kind of content maybe to start putting out that is going to attract them to go, oh, that's pretty cool, you know, my alumni association's doing this thing. I'm, I'm, I collect cars, and they're doing a car, uh, a car wash. So if you know your audience, you can understand how to engage them. So that's, that's your strategy development. I know my audience and I know my strategy development. And then the creative content is, what photographs am I going to put out there? How am I going to show the way? So look at it like a flashlight. How do, I, how do I cast a light on what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to ask people to do? So just putting a post on, and I'll use Facebook as an example, because it's probably one of the more used formats, I would imagine. Just putting on a, face, a Facebook post, it's, it's sort of like the, the proverbial, if a tree falls in the woods. You know, you put a post on Facebook, and if nobody really knows why it's there or what it is, and you're not notifying it any other way, well, it's just going to sit there. And I've had a lot of clients do the same thing with YouTube videos. They say, I want to, you know, I want to spend ten thousand dollars on a YouTube video. And I said, mm, okay. And then a month later, it has thirteen views on YouTube. And, you know, twelve of them are, are them. You know, and one was me checking to see if it was there. And then they complain. They say, well, why did I spend ten thousand dollars on that? I said, well because you didn't spend the other money to do all the other things you need to activate that video. You have to activate the things. So then your results, you want to measure it. You want to say, okay, 13, that's not a good number. We want it, if you want it to go viral, you know, 1.3, that's a great number. So you want to make sure that you have results. So if you're going to do something with the Alumni Association in your area, and you put out some content, and you realize it doesn't go anywhere and nobody does anything, don't do that. Change your tactic. Don't do it because you like doing it. Do it because, you, and that, this is a good rule to live by too. <coughs> If you understand your audience, do what they need, don't do what you need. I give that counsel to brands all the time. Brands always want to do what we want to do. We have a new product we want to launch. We need people to buy it. I said, what does your audience need? Because the audience may not want this new product. They might need you to be a counselor of some sort. They might need information. And that goes into this. The brand mission. How should social convey the brand mission? So the brand mission is to sell more hamburgers. Well, then how does social sell more hamburgers? Well, the business imperative, we need to support that goal. We have to sell hamburgers. But the user needs, we have to go over here and listen. What do, what do they need? What do they really want? They want nutrition information because they've got kids now. So if my brand wants to sell hamburgers, we're going to develop a plan that does that, or we're going to do it through explaining that our hamburgers are more healthy, more organic, or locally sourced. So then all of a sudden you tie that together and there's a strategy there. We're not just going to talk about your delicious hamburgers. They're, they're, Hugo's hamburgers are delicious. Let's talk about how they're sourced, what they're made of, and why it's okay for your kids to eat these as opposed to the other guys. Categories of social listening. This is what I go through on a daily basis in the, in the brand world. We have to look at keywords, channels, and audiences. Keywords are literally what are people searching for? And there's tools now. You can go in and you can say some of the highest search keywords are X, Y, and Z based on, you know, it's kind of like the, the top of the news day. It's what's trending. You can see what's trending, what keywords are trending. But the channels, you want to make sure that you're looking at different channels because certain things are happening on Pinterest, certain things are happening on LinkedIn, certain things are happening on Twitter, certain things are happening on Facebook. So you have to look at the channels and see, for your, for your example here, would be see where, where your audience is participating. And then the keywords, what they're saying. Because your audience there, you've got to figure out there might be one of your alumnus that's in your area that has huge reach. And so you might want to key off of that person to make sure that, that person is activated. So you might have a hundred, but there might be this one person you're like, hey Bob, I need you really to help me out. You know, I'm doing this fundraiser this next weekend and I really need you to help you out. I know you've got that great blog on uh, car collecting. You know, would you mind putting something out on it? Let's, or let's do a little quick little funny video together and put it on your blog. So then he's, he's reaching his audience. So to develop the strategy, and this, this is a brand exercise. We go through this all the time. Brands typically go right to the tactic. They say, I want to do, I need Facebook posts. So I always have to reel them back in and say, well, first thing we have to do is figure out what are the goals and objectives. Goals and objectives sell more hamburgers. So okay, let's research. Let's find out what the hamburger market is in the United States. Let's find out who else is selling hamburgers. Let's find out where the point of differentiation is. What's, what's different about our hamburger? Do all that through research. That's gonna lead us to the strategy, which is comprised of these things. Now we've, we've understood the buyer profile, we've done the research to figure out who they are, who's our target audience. 
What are the solutions they're looking for, and what are the solutions we can provide? What are the communications objectives? Organic, less fat, you know, healthy, uh, whole grain, gluten free, whatever it may be for the hamburger. And then the tactical delivery. Well, you know what? We think we could probably launch this on a Pinterest page. We think there's probably some robust Facebook things we could do. And I think we should do a process of how to, you know, uh, fun to table video. And we could do it in a humorous way. We're going to do it as claymation because we want to we want to approach a younger audience. And we think this could go viral and be on some of the other younger networks. So that's our tactical delivery. And success is going to be either we're selling more hamburgers, that's the ultimate goal, but or we built our audience base. Because a lot of brands will ask you, um, Dude, what's the ROI on this? How many more hamburgers am I going to sell doing social media? And a lot of times it's not a monetary ROI. I usually say, what's the ROI of you not doing it? Because the other guy's doing it. And so part of it is doing it because you need to do it. The other part of it is, what is it worth to reach this audience as opposed to not reaching this audience at all? And so the fact of the matter is, if I get one person to buy another hamburger and tell their neighbor what a great hamburger that is, then I, this whole thing is worthwhile. So the ROI is getting to maybe one person, because one person, you don't know who they're connected to. So, Implementation and engagement. This is where it gets it gets it gets crazy, but it's not. It's it's literally going social networks, then the social content networks. This is where you know you have people probably send you stuff all the time. They'll say, check out this video or look at this thing. It's on, and you're like, where did you get that? They found it because they're in some they they've got some subscription to something. They got it in their email. They're part of a they're they're part of the ecosystem that you're not part of. Now you can go over there and be part of that, but I get content all the day, all day long, and I'm thinking, where, where did that person get that from? They got it from a content network, which also could be a group or a forum. So to use it in uh, in the car collector vernacular, if there's car collectors out there, they're over in a car collector forum, and somebody just did a rebuild of a really cool thing of a really unique automobile, and they did a video, and they put it out here as an RSS feed because they had a blog. And so the RSS feed then gets picked up over here by somebody who's on LinkedIn who's a car collector. And then they post it to their Facebook page and you happen to be their friend. So all of a sudden you just saw the rebuild of a 1962 Corvette engine because a friend of yours posted it, or a friend of theirs posted it, and it ended up on your Facebook feed. So it's, the, it's, it's that creep that the, the organic nature of the way the internet works, where you can produce a piece of content and you can get it later, and you guys don't even have to know each other. You have to have a common interest. And then if you have a common interest, Razorbacks, you have a common interest, then all of a sudden now you guys can talk and do things together, and then you guys can produce something that then you guys find. So it's kind of a network, and so from a brand standpoint, from an agency standpoint, that's what we're always trying to get to do, is, is hook you up with her and make sure that you guys talk, because you guys are gonna go out and tell everybody about how great our hamburgers are. So we don't necessarily want to get to you all. We want to get to two people that are connected to then connect other people. So measurement. This is where it gets tough because the internet seems to be so, um, you know, if you look at Twitter, it can be a bunch of noise. But there are a lot of tools out there that allow you to filter that noise. And one of the, one of the ways to do that is the hashtag. Volunteers rock. So hashtags are great these days. Because if you've got a hashtag that you either launch or a hashtag that's already in existence and you join that conversation, you can then search that hashtag on Twitter and there's various other tools where you can only come up with that content. And so you can find out the 30 people that just posted in the last hour, what did they have to say? And you might pick out, you know what, there's 15 people here I'd really like to talk to. But everybody here is talking about my hamburgers. They're all talking about it. But I use tools to find out who's talking about it, what's their reach, who are they, do they have followers, do they have a blog, are they male, are they female, are they 18 to 49, segment, segment, segment. It's pretty scary what you can find out about people, really, these days. It's pretty terrifying. But once you do that, then you segment them off. And you say, you know what, these are my influencers because collectively they have 200,000 reach from their blogs. These are my amplifiers. They're the people that follow those blogs, and they put content out. And then these are the prospects. Those are the people that follow the people. So it backtracks. 
So you've got people that are really, really well connected and they talk about your topic. And then you've got people that follow them because they're interested in that topic. And then you've got people that follow them because they're interested in that person because they follow that person. So once you carve up the demographic, you'll know you want to get your prospects one day to be your influencers. But the only way to do that is to engage them with specific content and things that will help them. So if you look at it from a blog perspective, I, I, I use another farm analogy. If, if you have a blog, and you have a blog, and I give exclusive content to this farm, I give seeds, fertilizer, health, machinery, and I don't give anything to you, his blog is more successful, his farm is more successful, he's producing more crops. So he's more successful, now he's really grateful. He's like, hey, thanks a lot, you gave me that exclusive with the CEO. You gave me that piece of content no one else had. You gave me the coupons that allowed me to go out and get the stuff so I could write the article, so I could sample the product. That's turning him into an influencer. Now you might be following him because he's got better content than you, somehow. Where'd you get that content? So you might ask him, where'd you get that content? Well, I got it from over here. So it might, it might cause you to join another group to hopefully amplify yourself. And so you become, you're an amplifier you're hoping to turn yourself into an influencer. So it's, a, it's about identifying your audience and finding out what are they connected to, how, how deeply are they connected. And, it, and you can't do it, the, the hard part about like an audience like this is there are tools out there that do this, but they're expensive tools. There are tools that the brands use and the agencies use. You know, there's tools that I use that are, that are hundreds if not thousands of dollars a month that can identify you and where you live and how many kids you have and where you went to high school and what kind of car you drive and all kinds of stuff. What kind of phone you have, what's your email address. And people that don't have access to those tools have to find other ways to do it. There are a lot of free tools. There are a lot of tools out there. If you search free tools for identifying influencers, you'll come up with lists, you'll come up with blog posts of 50 or 60 tools that do that. And there are free, I mean, I use some of the free stuff all the time because some of it has to be. Some of it I can't charge the client for because they, they think I already know. So I have to go out and use some of the free tools. All right, so all these social networks, I picked some of the top ones. I picked Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Vine, Tumblr. They all have kind of the same result at the end. The measurement of attention, engagement, authority, influence, and sentiment are all the same. Those are the things you want to measure in social media. So overall, attention really means just total media consumption. And that's, in the old PR days, it would be, how many impressions did it get? So I put a video out there, I got a million views. That's total impressions from a YouTube perspective. But then engagement, total interactions. How many people liked it? How many people clicked like? How many people clicked share? How many people commented? So total interactions is engagement. Authority is trackback. So authority is how many people took my content and baked it into their content. So where did my piece of media, my video, my blog post, where did it go after that? Did it go somewhere? Did it get embedded? And then influence is total ongoing engaged subscribers. How many people, have, now that's, that's how many Facebook likes do I have? How many fans do I have? So I've got 113 uh, Facebook fans on my alumni page. So of those 113, how many are engaged? You know, 56? And that's, that's the number you have to realize. You know, when you, when you make a post on Facebook, you're not posting to your entire audience. Facebook has made that very clearly evident you have to spend money to do that. So I, I got in this conversation with General Mills a couple years ago, where they, you know, they have a million followers or something, and you know, when they post, they're only getting to about a thousand. Unless they do paid posting, and they get, for every bump up in revenue, sure. What's, uh, what, what is, where does that thousand come from out of a million? I mean, how are they, how does Facebook? It's a, it's a Facebook algorithm, has to do with edge rank. And essentially, uh, the way Facebook governs it, the way they did their revenue model was that if I put a post out, I have a million followers and a million people see it, they started thinking, well, how can we control that to some degree? And the, the solution was to come up with the fact that if you do a promoted post, you'll be allowed to get to your entire audience. And so when you have a fan page, you probably have the analytics that says how many people, how many people saw this. And it's, you know, I don't know how many people you're talking about, but like on Mitchell's, We'll put out a post and we'll say, you know, uh, 230 people saw this. Well, we have, you know, two or 3,000 people on our Facebook page. And the fact of the matter is, 
the way that Facebook really works is if you and I engage a lot, let's say you and I are pals, right? we engage a lot, I'm gonna see every picture and everything yeah. you ever do. But if you and I engage every now and then, and you and I never do, I'm gonna see maybe something she posts or if she comments on your post, I'm never gonna see you, even though we're all, we're all connected. So that's the way Facebook works. If you're not engaged with your audience, that's why engagement is so important. If you're just posting content and you're thinking, well, I put it out there, I hope everybody sees it, it didn't. You have to actually get them to interact with it. And that's why you see a lot of brands put out like this to show your support for whatever, like this if you think today's a great day, you know, like this if you're superstitious on Friday the 13th. Because pressing like them for them means the next post they get, you're probably going to see it because of the way the algorithm is working. So they want you to like things or comment on them because it puts them in the queue. Otherwise, they have to spend money to get to you. Right. And that engagement also shows up in the news feed of their friends. Correct. It helps increase the organic reach. Correct, correct. And that's, that's what you really want to get to because if I know my audience and I know that I'm getting to the right person, what I really want to know, you know, he's got 700 followers on his Facebook page. I want to make sure I'm getting to him so that my message is getting to them. And that's what brands want to do. So that organic reach is really important, but the engagement part can't happen if you're broadcasting. But if you're asking questions and getting replies, then you're starting to build that audience. So of a million people, I don't know, I don't know whether there's a way to actually engage all million. I don't think, I don't even know if that's possible. But the, the more people you get to, if you get 400 likes on a, on a photograph and 700 on something else, and you're doing really good work, you're doing really creative viral work, you're getting to more of that million audience. Well, then, sure. you, then if you get that like, if you get a big bump in likes, then should you immediately post a, real, a message that you really want to get yeah. across at that? I sure. Mean, once you get that bump in that. Well, yeah, two schools of thought. I mean, the short answer, yes. Why not? Because you've got an audience that's engaged. You've got people leading forward. You know, it's sort of like saying, well, I've got a captive room here. I should probably say something smart. Nah, I'll do it later. No, you should probably do something. But another school of thought would be if you have the time and effort and the, you know, the, the fortitude, reach out to each person and thank them for liking your post or whatever they did. Now, that's what Twitter's good for. See a lot of, once again, broadcast is no good. If you put out something and everybody likes it and you don't say anything back, you're not being a good neighbor. You know, if I say that's a great shirt you have on, and you say thank you very much. I, I mean, right, I, thanks I, a lot. So you say, oh, I like your shirt too. So then, oh, okay, great, now we're, now we're talking. So if I just put something out and you like it, and I go, okay, and I turn my back on you, that, I'm, not, I'm not being, a conversationalist. I'm not being a good neighbor. And that's really what this is about. Social media is really about taking the time to actually talk, you know, online. I can see a day where we'll never leave our houses again, and we'll have the best friends in the world, and we won't even know them. <laughs> you know, because of that. But it's that interaction that people really want. And I tell you what, anytime I tweet something on Twitter, whether it be good or bad, you know, and I have a have, I, I complain about brands when, they when I feel like they're not doing right by me, or if they're not doing right by somebody I see. If I see a brand not treating someone else well, I'm thinking, hmm, I'll get you. And you know what? Nine out of ten times, the brand will get back to me and say something. I had a real big problem with UPS a couple years ago. And I took care, I took it to Twitter. I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'll fix their Apple cart. You know, and I've, I've got like 800 followers or something. I'm, I'm nobody on Twitter, really. But they got back to me immediately and they solved the problem. And actually, somebody came out to my house. So boom, 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 in about four days, UPS cared. Huge advocate now. Now I'm like, Twitter's up the bomb, I love Twitter, I love UPS the bomb. And so they turned from just an effort of the driver showed up, heard what I had to say, apologized, shook my hand, I was like, you didn't have to do that. You could have just left me a disgruntled, yeah. nameless, faceless person in the neighborhood. But they took the time to actually, hey, sorry about that. And now I'm a huge fan. But if you're ancient and have seen dinosaurs or hobbs, it's hard to. Can't say that to me. It's hard to, um, you know, it's hard for my vocabulary to learn to hashtag properly to make it. I don't feel like I'm making a connection. Well, the hashtag is punctuation. 
So if you say, if I made a pot of, uh, thing of brownies and I handed them to you, and you'd be like, these are delicious. Hashtag delicious. And if you click on delicious, hashtag delicious on Twitter, you'll see all the people that just ate something within the last 30 seconds <laughs> that said that it was delicious. Yeah. So if you look at its punctuation, like you just want to add a little, you know, like TGIF. TGIF is a hashtag. Hashtag TGIF. And that it's it's one of those things where the hashtag denotes a lot of times the emotion. In this, volunteers rock. It denotes the category of conversation that will allow somebody to go back in and say, you know what, we had a real engaged audience. Or, you know what, that didn't work at all. Nobody said anything. We need to change our tactic. And I go through this with brands right now. They want to have a they want to have a hashtag that doesn't mean anything. A hashtag that's a bunch of symbols and numbers because it means it's the product UPC code or something. I think nobody's ever going to know that. Nobody's ever going to follow it. Why don't you make the hashtag, um, you know, bananas rock? Because you're trying to sell bananas. Or, you know, Chiquita or something. That lets that so when I do an organic search on Twitter for a topic for that hashtag, delicious, the content comes up. So if you make your hashtag obscure that no one's going to know about, if you make it so insular that it only is going to apply to you and, and your best friend next door, nobody's going to find it. So that's the way to think about it. Don't think of yourself as a dinosaur. Think of yourself as as having to learn a new language to some degree. I mean that's really what it was. And, and by the way, I'm ancient. <laughs> I'm teaching people often that are half my age that don't know about this stuff. And, I, and I'm fortunate because of my time launching, you know, one of the, arguably one of the biggest websites on the planet. You know, we didn't know what we were doing. We were in HTML, I had no idea what it was. And so I've just stayed in this medium. And part of it, nefariously, was so I wouldn't become a dinosaur. Because you know what? There are people, there are kids that are 22 years old coming out of college that they want my job. So I better know more about this than them, or I'm not going to be very valuable. And you know what? They want less money doing it. So don't think of yourself that way. Think of yourself as how do I how do I amp up my game? How do I, you know, once again, it's, you know, if you're throwing a party, you're having a cocktail party at your house. What are you doing to make you know what party favors do you have? What's the invite look like? You know, think of it that way. And I really encourage everybody to think of all of this in a way that applies to you. Something you do in your life applies to this. So if it, if it is a party, like if you're a real big party thrower, what do you do to make your parties memorable? Okay, so what do you do to make your tweets memorable? What do you do to make your Facebook posts memorable? And it doesn't have to be this big out-of-box thinking, but I see a lot of brands that want us to put basically a paragraph of, of press release copy as the Facebook post. And I think, I know, oh, nobody's going to care. But if you look at brands like Taco Bell, some of the others like you know, Oreo, that have a real more you know, edgy feel to them. Well, they put out content that people, and uh, by you know, younger people, want to interact with. So if you're if you're pumping out press release content, it's going to fall on deaf ears because you're just marketing. But if you're putting out content that really literally speaks to me, I'm interested in what you have to say. And you're, hey, Trace, I'm having a cocktail party this weekend. I really like it. You came, and you know what? We're carving pumpkins. Carving pumpkins. I love that. So if you're, if you're inviting and you're engaging, and also if you have a call to action, we're carving pumpkins, would you mind bringing a pumpkin? Oh sure, yeah, where are you gonna go? Okay, yeah, I'm going, now I'm bringing a pumpkin. I went from not going to carrying a pumpkin over your house. I have a question. Yes, of course. Okay, so let's say you're having a watch party or a fundraiser or an event, and you're wanting to let people know through Facebook, through your Facebook page. Yep. How do, do you have tips or ideas of of how to post properly and, and make it interesting. And for instance, I heard of the best status update is never over seven words. Like, don't give them too much information right. and write a whole paragraph. Well, it's, I mean, we've all fallen victim now to attention span deficit disorder. We're all, <laughs> we all are. I mean, you know, people can't stay off their phones long enough. People are tweeting and texting. And I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's embarrassing. So, yeah. Sorry, no, I'm not looking at you. That's right, I called my boss out of here. Oh, sweetness. Yeah. At least, thanks. But um, the, the answer, it's a tough answer. The answer is, I'll go back to dating once again. You know, I don't know if you're married or I don't know if you're dating or not, but I mean, you know, before I got married, you know, you walk into the bar, the museum, the restaurant, wherever, you're, wherever you go. You have to be interesting. So that seven word post, I don't think there is a formula like that, by the way. I don't think you need to listen to that. I think what it should be is, are you interesting? Okay. 
You know, it's sort of like people that tell jokes, you're like, eh, no, no, no. you know, it's just that you're like, oh, you're kind of a comedy killer, you shouldn't, maybe you shouldn't be a comedy killer. <laughs> so, I think posts like that should be a call to action, so you're asking people to do something on your behalf. Hey everybody, I'm looking for something. Everybody who has one, please share it here. And see what that does. Okay. You know, I, I need photographs of cats for this weekend. I'm putting together a collage, I'm making this up. Sometimes I make up stuff. My wife rolls her eyes. I look at that. But you know, I, I, I need something from you. I need I need all of you to go out and do one thing for me. You know, we go do it. Well, okay, four or five people do it. Well, you've got to them. Hey, thanks for doing it. By the way, thank them. Because brands that thank people. People that thank people, I tend to want to do something more for you. Because, oh, that was not, you know, cool. You didn't have to thank me. But I appreciate that. Let me know if I can help you some more. But to be engaging means to be interesting. Don't don't just put out a calendar event. But also go, you know, go the extra mile. If you're connected to these people on Facebook, on their Facebook, go to their page and post something. You know, oftentimes you should do that. Go to their page and say, hey, you know, Sally, I'm doing this fundraiser this weekend. I need your support. We're going to make a bunch of t-shirts. I need somebody to come over here and help me, you know, iron t-shirts. Do you know anybody else who will help? Do you think that you can overpost or overdo it? Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of tools out there now that automate things um, and automated replies and things like that. I'm not a fan of those. I have a couple of formulas for me, like one of the formulas I use. Um, it's a program called IFTTT, if this, then that. And one of the triggers that I have set up, if I like a picture on Instagram, it is immediately published to my Tumblr feed. And since using it, maybe for the last month, I've got about 50 new followers on my Tumblr feed without doing anything. So Tumblr's for a blog, but my blog is largely curation of content. So the other thing you might think about is turning your Facebook effort into a different effort to build an audience somewhere else. Then you notify that audience there, hey, go on Facebook because the fundraiser information is there, and turn it into an invite. So, you know, a lot of people use Facebook as the end all be all. And really, the answer is you probably should be using more channels. And probably, like in your alumni chapters, one thing you might want to do, and if you maybe you already do this, is develop a hashtag and then let your people know that this is the hashtag you look for. And I don't know how connected your, your audience is either. See, that's the other thing. You, you've got to realize are, is your audience online? And if they're not online, you know, heaven forbid, you know, go put flyers on doors or do a mailer. I use an app called Postagram. This might be a, a very appropriate app for you guys. Postagram, it's a free app. The first three are free and they're sponsored by a brand. And after that, they're 99 cents. And what it does is it allows you to pick a picture off your phone, Instagram feed, or just off your camera roll, and turn it into a postcard a real live postcard. You, you can type the text and say, hey, dear so-and-so, having a fundraiser this weekend or next week, if you want to do it up any time. Postagram prints that and mails it for 99 cents. You can't go buy a postcard and mail it in the US for less than 99 cents. So it's a pretty good deal. So to reach people organically, you could actually mail them a photograph of the thing <coughs> you're doing or of you doing it and actually send them a piece of mail that has the link Hey, by the way, go here and sign up. I really need your help. You can send that to 10 people. It just costs you 10 bucks. It's a dollar a time. Yeah, it's 99 cents. The first three are free, but they're sponsored. I, I just did it with my mom because she's not online, and they, they were sponsored by Cotton Club. <laughs> so it's also a good thing. I talk to brands about it. I'm like, hey, this is a good It's a, how to get your brand in front of people that aren't online. Do you have a choice on who is your brand? No. The first three are just sponsored by whoever is sponsoring it at the, at the time. Okay. But I went through those three really quickly. Now, I said my, because I have, I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old, yeah. and my, my mother lives in Portland, Oregon, where I'm from, and I, about every other day, I'm, I'm spending about five bucks a week sending her pictures of the kids, because she doesn't get to see them, and she's not online. Yeah. So to me, it's genius, but it's also a good way for the non-digital to be reached by the digital. Um, Did you have another question? Yeah, I mean, just given the audience that you're talking to right now, I mean, do you think it's efficient for us to be worrying about things like Tumblr and Pinterest when you're talking about an, an alumni group? I mean, I, I personally, as a, as a male, I don't think I would ever look, go to Pinterest to search out the Denver Alumni Association. Well, yeah, or okay. Tumblr, I mean, I, I think it's more of a targeted audience, so then, uh, therefore, I'm asking, I guess my question is, is it worth my time to kind of set all these avenues up? Because I don't necessarily think that 
the audience that I'm trying to target is going to be associating these programs with what they're looking for. Yeah, okay, so here's the answer I'll give is I'm, I'm platform agnostic. Okay. I don't recommend any platform. What I do is recommend the platform that gets to your audience. Right. So whatever works for your audience, you should use. What I typically do is I go to those platforms and I look at who's using them. And I start thinking, because I've searched stuff on Pinterest, I'm like, there can't be anything on Pinterest about this. And I think, oh my god, there's a ton. Look at all this stuff. So one of them, I use Pinterest, and I'm a dude. You know, now, a lot of people say, you know, Pinterest is for women and it's for people who want to buy drinks and boots and purses. <laughs> and, it's, and it's really classic, nice, right? <laughs> and make wreaths, right? Make holiday crafts. Yeah, it's great for care. And it's not. I mean, it, it goes into all kinds of things, from coin collecting to automotive stuff to, I mean, there's all kinds of how to rebuild an engine. I mean, you can see pins on that kind of stuff. I mean, but they do sell from that say. bit. Oh, no, absolutely. And Pinterest, but Pinterest is the highest growing uh, Pinterest and Tumblr right now. And Snapchat, which I don't want to get into, that gets a whole other layer of social. But Pinterest and Tumblr right now are the two big ones. Um, I call, and I, it's, I can't, I, I can't coin this phrase, but I call Facebook the mom genes of social networks. The, the millennial groups aren't using Facebook; they're using Instagram. So by by default, it was a genius purchase. They're using Facebook by default because they're using Instagram. They're using Instagram as their social platform. You know, they're using uh, Snapchat as their social platform. They're using Tumblr. They're using Reddit, Imager. They're just literally sharing content. Now, once again, I would say, don't and don't don't create a platform and then not use it. The worst thing you can do. It's back in the craze of five years ago where brands were creating microsites and then not doing anything with them, and they were just these dusty cobweb built non entities that people could find, and then they would hack them and put graffiti on them, essentially electronic graffiti. So don't start a Pinterest page if you don't think your audience would go there. But if you find some of your audience is on Pinterest, then engage them there and share things they might want to let them know who you are. Once again, it's that part of that dating thing. You, you can't just know about the other person. They're going to want to know about you. So you also want to invite them and say, hey, I'm into whatever I'm into. Check out my board. And, you, and you, if you try it, some of this stuff's addictive. I mean, my wife, that's, we're that's the same age. Some of, of the this stuff my wife doesn't do, and I get her to do it, and then I now I can't stop with it. Yeah, I mean that's kind of what I was asking. It's like you know, running an alumni association on my off time is one thing, and this you know to totally engage in social media—that's a full-time job almost. You know, just mm -hmm. listening to what you're saying. I spend probably a half an hour, maybe an hour a day on my social network. I have three email addresses. I have boards and profiles and uh, uh, platforms. I do a lot of automated stuff so that when I do one thing, right. it does three things. And then I also, I stay engaged through programs like, like uh, TweetDeck and Hootsuite. I have them open on my computer. And I, you know, I have a job where I sit in front of a computer a lot when I'm not doing this kind of stuff. And so it's up in the background. I see something go by and I'm like, oh, what's going on in Syria? And I, so I've got my news feed. And then I'm in the know. And then I post something on Facebook because I just know something. And so then I get an audience interested because I know stuff. And now people think I know stuff before it happens. <laughs> part of it is I'm, I'm a news junkie. I mean, part of it, when you work for a place like CNN, you don't ever really leave CNN. And you're, I'm, a, I'm a news junkie. And so a lot of my friends rely on me. They'll, they'll post on my Facebook page, say, what's, what's going on in Egypt today? And I'm, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure. I was, I'm, work, I'm working on a client. And, you know, quit bugging me. But I, I think part of it is, is allowing time. I get this at my own agency. My, part of my job is to do this in my own agency, where people are saying, come on, I'm not going to do that. And so part of it is literally making sure that you make time to do something that you didn't have to do before, but you have to do now. If you're gonna be that, if you're gonna be a brand ambassador, if you're gonna build your brand, right? So if you're gonna be the best fill in the blank ever, you've gotta do effort. You've gotta make some effort. You can't just do it by saying you are. You have to actually make time. It's sort of like working out. My wife goes to the gym every day because she's still trying to lose the baby weight from her second our two-year-old. I haven't tried to lose it. But she goes every day, and part of that is she can't not do it because then she wouldn't be doing it. So I mean, I, I don't know if that makes sense, but you can't you can't build your brand if you're not willing to build your brand. Right? You can't build it by just going. I don't have time. You have to make time. Get up a half hour earlier and do some posting. Like blogging is one of the most uh, time-consuming things that I do. I try to do it once a week. I try to make it smart and interesting. So I don't just try to do it for volume. I try to do it so that it makes sense for an audience that I'm trying to reach or so it makes me sound smart but I, I hate it I hate it but I do it 
because it's, it's kind of part of who people want me to, you know, they're like, Trace, you gotta, you know, you're supposed to be smart and stuff, what do you, you haven't said anything. Did you have a question? Hey, well, there are so many options, and with an alumni group, your audience is very diverse. You have young alumni who are, you know, maybe on Vine and Twitter, you have older alumni who are on the, the mom jeans, and, and then you have those who aren't on social media at all, that it's overwhelming to manage when it is just, it's not your full-time job. Um, you know, I've heard you shouldn't post the same thing to multiple outlets, multiple social media outlets, but, you know, to refine it for different audiences by, you know, whichever social media it is, that's, it, it is, it's just really overwhelming. How do you, you know, make it more manageable, package that down to, to what you can? Well, the, I think the real, the real broad stroke here is manage what you can. Don't try to do it all. So figure out, okay, where are the younger alumni hanging out? I'm gonna do something there. Where are the older alumni hanging out? And I'm gonna do something there. Pick two things. You don't have to do it all. You have to kind of down out there and, 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 you know, with our group, I, we, we create a Facebook page. And anytime anybody emails us, we kind of shove them to the Facebook page. It's like, you know, you want information about what we're doing, please go to our Facebook page. Like you're saying, I don't want to have to be sending out emails, then going to a Twitter, right. and then doing this, and then doing that, when I'm all just basically trying to get the same message across. So it's like I keep trying to send my group to one channel, so that's where you know, right. that's where you know the information is, or you go here to the alumni website, that's another place you can get it. Because it's a full-time job. Right. So so use one channel that's really that's your base, and then use maybe other options to drive people to that one. Yeah, I don't think you have to care and feed. Like my Tumblr feed, I don't care and feed it. I use it as everything I do and it ends up there. So if you want to know too. everything I do, it's that's my little, that's the sewer drain off of all the stuff I do. And it, But it's automated. So I don't have to go there and feed that. Mm -hmm. It feeds itself. Okay. So if you want to know everything I think about and do on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, go to my Tumblr feed. And you can weed through that. But it's not targeted towards anybody. So the targeted stuff, you want to make sure, I mean, really, what, I mean, are you talking about getting to hundreds of people or thousands of people? Hundreds. I mean, the real thing to do would be, you know, in your part-time, in the two hours a day you do this, or the, on a Saturday you choose to do it for the month, reach out to that hundreds of people. Start checking it off the list. I mean, go old school. You know, my dad had a business when I was a kid, and we used to hand out flyers and put them on the door. Go old school and reach out to, say, today I'm going to reach out to 10 people. Literally, I'm gonna reach out to them and say, hey, I have a Facebook page, it tells you everything you need to know, and I update it once a day. Please come check it out and uh, post a picture of your family. Do that for 10 people, and then the next day, do it 10 people, and the next day, 10 people, until you knocked out 200 people, or 150, or 100, or 95, however many it is. Take that time, to take the front end time to build that audience, and then they're all there, or at least 60% of them came and did something. And then that's where they're at. And then you're only managing one channel, but you did the upfront legwork. I mean, that's one way. This is a, a content slide. This just shows you sort of the sheer numbers. This is every minute, every minute on the internet. These are the numbers that are happening. So that's that's noise. That's all these people. Where do they find the time? Where do they find the time? So I mean, really, the the, the thing to think about is don't don't try to do too much, or you'll do nothing well. I mean, I think somebody says that better than I do sometimes. Just do what you can do really well. But I mean, take the time. I think if you're, you know, if, you, if it was 10,000 people you're trying to get, you can't do that one off. But if you've got 112 people in your chapter, knock those off over 10 weeks. You know, 10 people, 10 weeks, and after 10 weeks, you've invited them to a, a specific place, include the, the link, and ask for something. We want to show we're doing a, a family thing. We want to show a picture of your family. You know, and if you don't have kids, you know, your dog, whatever, your car, whatever your family represents, we're trying to build a picture on our Facebook page. Please go here and do that. Give somebody a call to action, because if you ask somebody to do something that isn't a heavy lift, like give me five bucks, give me a photograph. Sure, here, here's my photograph, publish. And then you've got their, then you've got them, and then you all of a sudden you have 75 people that's posted on your Facebook page. Those 75 people now are engaged in your network, but now you've got to keep engaging them. Don't stop engaging them. The last slide I'll show you guys. This hits home for everybody. <laughs> Social media has always been here. You just do it on your phone now. 
I mean, this, this, is, this was my dad's desk growing up, you know? LinkedIn, your Rolodex, Pinterest is your board, YouTube is the window you look out of, Reddit is comic strips, Skype is a telephone, Tumblr is a clip, clippings, Imager, I don't know how many people you know here of Imager. Imager is used a lot by people who use Reddit, you know what Reddit is? Reddit is sort of the backwaters of the internet, it's sort of the murky underworld that a lot of brands are playing, but it's where everybody that's under about 27 years old is. <laughs> So, yeah, but I mean, ignoring it doesn't make it go away, too. I always say that just because you don't want to choose to ignore it doesn't make it go away. But Imager is where you can find awesome brand pictures of people doing things with celebrities and viral things because the things that are poached out of Imager often end up here and there and there and there and here. So the stuff that's going on there gets circulated. I, I, I would welcome you to go to it's I M G U R. It's pronounced Imager. Imager.com. I would welcome you to go there. You know, you, you may find something not safe for work. Um, you know, <laughs> caveat. But a lot of stuff is just really cool, interesting. A lot of comedy. A lot of really creative thinking going on there. And it's where a lot of people are hanging out and getting this content. And you find where did you find that? That's where they found. So, with that, any other questions? I, I mean, I hope this was helpful. It's, it's, I know it can be overwhelming, it doesn't have to be. But pick and choose what you do, and then do it a lot. Do it, you know, and not too much, you know, don't spam people, but engage with people. And if you find somebody's really engaged with your Facebook page, engage with them a lot. And say, hey, I'm really glad you're engaged. You know, can you, can you get a hold of so-and-so? Because I can't get a hold of them. So use people to be your embassy. You know, use people to be your, your, your message Givers. Okay. Don't do it all yourself. Actually ask people, hey, I'm, I need a photograph of a Chevy today. Send me one. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.